Hey everyone, well let's jump right in. Here's the AliExpress Jingsha, Jingsha, I think it's pronounced Jingsha X58 motherboard. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get an overview on this motherboard and get some benchmarks as well. On the last video we did an unboxing. This kind of gave us some general information on the board and now we're just going to go a bit deeper to see what this board can offer us. First off, it is an inexpensive X58 motherboard. It's new for the most part. Now the chipset is no longer manufactured, so those are going to be used on these motherboards. The price of this board came to about $54 after shipping and taxes. It's just above some of the base models that I've seen online. Now the reason I'm going for this one is that it does have onboard USB 3.0 for the front panel and on the back I.O. From the AliExpress uh, webpage where this motherboard was being sold, we can see that this board is a micro ATX board. It does have one PCI Express 16x slot, one PCI Express 1x slot, and a standard PCI slot. Also, it states it does support Gigabit Ethernet. There are also two RAM slots for DDR3 memory, and with the board supporting up to 32 gigabytes total. Now, it doesn't really specify if it's 32 gigabytes per slot or overall, and at the moment, I don't really have a 32 gigabyte stick that I can test it out with, but maybe down the line I might. There are four SATA 2.0 ports. Now, it's not a lot, but it should be sufficient. Now, the only downside would be that these are limited to three gigabits per second when it comes to speed instead of six gigabits per second. If you're using a standard mechanical hard drive, you won't really notice a difference, but if you're using a newer SSD, then you'll see that it won't be running at its fullest potential. As for the fan headers, there are three, a four pin header for the CPU cooler and two three pin headers for the system or case fans. Now one of those two will be blocked when you install your GPU into this type of system. Now if you do want to end up using that fan header, you may have to bend the cable or the wire from the fan itself just a little bit. As for the rear ports, we have six regular USB 2.0 ports along with the two USB 3.0 ports. There are two PS2 ports for your mouse and keyboard. There's also an audio port or audio section uh, for ports on the back which uses the Realtek ALC892 chipset. And for power, there is the standard 24 pin connector as well as the 8 pin connector to the motherboard. Alright, so everything is pretty much on par on the motherboard to what we see in person to what we can compare on the actual description on the AliExpress webpage, except for a couple of things. Now, the first thing would be the rear audio connectors. It does vary slightly between the six ports on the actual listing compared to the three that we have here on our motherboard, but it isn't really a huge deal. Though the second issue is a bigger deal for me. On AliExpress, it does show that it's listed as having gigabit ethernet. Well, after testing, I can confirm that ours doesn't have gigabit ethernet. It is capped at 100 megabits per second. I have thoroughly tested it. I've tried different cables. I've tried different ports on my network switch, um, you know, thinking it was something on my end. And then I looked at the actual adapter that was inside the system on the actual motherboard. I looked it up in uh, Windows and it, it turns out that it's using the Realtek PCI FE family controller. Now the FE does stand for fast ethernet. This means that it's capped at 100 megabits per second. So for gigabit speeds, we would actually need to be seeing the Realtek PCIe GBE family controller instead. That's where we are able to get gigabit speeds. For many, having slower network speeds would be a huge turnoff. Downloading games, transferring files, all that would take a lot longer. So I went ahead and I purchased the Gigabit Ethernet card. Now I did go with the PCI card, not a PCI Express, just because I didn't want to block that um, the airflow for the GPU. As for the CPU, we will be using the Intel Xeon X5650 processor. It is a six core 12 thread CPU from 2011. At launch, it was priced at about $1,000, but now you're able to get it for about $10 on eBay. The base clock for the CPU is at 2.66 gigahertz and the max turbo frequency of 3.06 gigahertz. Now, depending on the board, you are able to overclock this processor. As for RAM, we were able to get kind of lucky on this one. Now, even though registered ECC server RAM is pretty cheap nowadays, we were able to snag this one, these two sticks for, of, of eight gigabytes a piece for $18. For the cooler, we are using the AliExpress Snowman CPU cooler that I bought a while back, about a couple months ago. For our hard drives, we will be using an older Crucial M500 240 gigabyte SSD and a salvaged Western Digital one terabyte mechanical hard drive, which I was able to pull from PC that was being recycled. And for the GPU, we'll be testing this system with an AMD RX 570 GPU from ASRock. 
our operating system will be Windows 10 Pro with all the updates done as of the time of making this video. And same thing goes for our, our GPU drivers. It, they are up to date as of the time of making this video. All right, so here's the last piece before getting into the actual benchmarks. The question is, can we overclock this motherboard? Well, the short answer is yes. Now the long answer is, well, it's not what we would really expect when comparing it to higher end motherboards. What we can do on this motherboard is increase the base clock rate. Many motherboards display this as the BCLK in the BIOS. Now on this motherboard, it's labeled as the CPU frequency setting. Depending on the motherboard, this could provide some benefits, but it is limited on the AliExpress motherboard. There are some things that you are able to adjust on this board, like the CPU and RAM voltage. You are able to enable or disable turbo mode, adjust the QPI settings, things like that. But this board is not as robust as other boards from long ago. Also, the build quality is kind of decent on this motherboard, but it's pretty basic, so I, I don't really want to push it to its limits. Even the Northbridge heatsink on this board does get pretty hot on regular stock speeds and even when in idle. So after fooling around for a while, testing different settings, we were able to get a stable overclock of 3.01 to 3.02 gigahertz on all cores. Anything beyond that wouldn't work. We would either get a blue screen of death during the boot up process or during the actual benchmark testing. Sometimes the system wouldn't even boot up at all. So fortunately this board does have a clear CMOS jumper on the actual board itself, which does reset everything back to stock. So this overclock isn't much, but it does allow us to squeeze a few more FPS in some games. Having this processor run at a constant overclock speed does provide a slight advantage compared to auto boosting from its stock speeds. Now keep in mind that your mileage may vary. I'm unsure if all of these boards allow the ability for this slight overclock. Also temperatures for the CPU were surprisingly decent when gaming and when running Prime 95. At its highest, we were probably looking at temperatures in the high 60s on average in Prime 95 and with gaming, they were a lot lower. Now finally, benchmarks. We are testing a handful of games, stuff that I usually play on my end. And also I have been unbanned from PUBG. I think it was a system glitch overall on their end since there was quite a few people that were going through the same experience that I was. So for the game settings, for all of these games, we're gonna be running with a high preset. For some games, the high preset is the highest that we're able to change it to, but for others, there are gonna be higher like ultra, but we're gonna be staying with the uh, high for now. Benchmarking PUBG was a little tough. There's no benchmarking tool, but I did try to keep it consistent playing on Sandhawk for both CPU speeds, but it was a little tough. There would be times when running across the landscape to where there wouldn't be much in front of you except for the ocean and the horizon. So this would definitely increase our frame rate. But there would be times where I would be running around areas where there would be a lot of geometry. So that would kind of bring it down. Overall, I'd say that there isn't really a huge difference in performance on either clock speed for this processor. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we are getting about similar performance between the two clock speeds on the CPU. There's a slight fraction of a difference with the overclock chip. Batman Arkham Knight. It is an older title, but it's still a fun game. Visually, for me, it still looks great. Here is where we start to see more of a noticeable difference between stock and overclocked. It's not much, but it's there. Rainbow Six Siege. Similar to Counter-Strike, this game doesn't really tax the hardware too much, so it does give us some pretty high frame rates on budget parts. Here we can see a nice gap of 16 frames per second between stock and overclock. Moving on to Ghost Recon Wildlands, on the high preset, we are getting 46 frames per second on stock and 51 frames per second when overclocked. Far Cry New Dawn gets us at 53 frames per second on stock, 57 frames per second when overclocked. Not a huge difference, but it's greatly appreciated. With Far Cry 5, similar to New Dawn, there's about four or so frames per second difference between the two clock speeds. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a bit more demanding. The processor did struggle a bit. We're barely breaking 30 frames per second on average on stock and even when it's overclocked. And similar results when it came to Assassin's Creed Origins. Okay, so what, what if you were to swap the CPUs from the $10 X5650 to the $25 X5675? Now this is a very popular chip. It has a base clock of 3.06 GHz, it can boost up to 3.46. Now on this Jinxia motherboard, we were able to overclock it to a constant 3.465 GHz on all cores. It's not much, but the difference is there. Looking at the benchmarks, we can see a couple of FPS difference in PUBG. But like I mentioned earlier on the X5650, I wouldn't really trust these numbers. 
and basically say that the game performs about the same at either speeds. Shadow of the Tomb Raider does show a similar difference like that of the X5650, about 1 FPS difference between the two speeds. Only a couple of frames difference on Arkham Knight, about 11 frames per second on Rainbow Six Siege, 4 more frames on Ghost Recon Wildlands, about 4 or 5 on Far Cry New Dawn and Far Cry 5, and pretty similar on Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Origins. So between the two CPUs, we can see that the overclocked X5650 performs similar to the stock X5675. You can't spend $10 on this X5650, put in a little bit of time and get similar performance of a $25 processor, or you can't spend the extra $15 and go for the $25 Xeon X5675 and run it at stock. Then, if you want, you can overclock that processor and you'll be able to, you know, squeeze a few more FPS. Is the $10 X5650 worth it for this type of build? Well, I mean, if you're on an extremely tight budget, then yeah. You can game on it with this inexpensive AliExpress motherboard, but if you can spare the extra 10 or $15, just go for the X5675. I wouldn't recommend going any higher than that for the CPU. For the total cost of $83.33 with shipping and taxes for the core components of the system, which, which would be the X5650, the motherboard, and the RAM, I'd say it's a decent deal. But again, this is only, only if you're on an extremely tight budget. The X58 platform is dying out, and to squeeze every last drop of performance, you would need to get a higher end motherboard for a decent overclock. But those boards are still pretty expensive. They're still over $100 plus, and they're used. Instead of putting together that type of build, I would rather invest it in a Ryzen 1600 AF CPU, which goes for like $85 on average, a decent B450 motherboard, and 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3000 megahertz RAM, or 3200 if it's on sale. You'll have new parts, newer architecture, and a newer platform. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video. It was fun playing with this type of motherboard. I hope it helps answer some of your questions that you may have had in regards to this item. And in the meantime, thank you for watching, take care, and have a great day.